Well, I'm going to mix it up a little bit now. Yeah, uh, yeah, well, I wonder show. what it's going to be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've deliberately got out what I think is one of the most horrendous Liverpool kits of all time. What would you give that marks out of 11? Hi, everybody. Welcome to the channel. And we are so pleased to have an extra, extra special guest uh, with us today. And it's not Craig. <laughs> <laughs> fucking whopper. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Sorry. You gotta leave this in. He's not a special right, guest, as you can tell. Hi, yeah. not bad. Can I call you back? I'm in the middle of a recording <laughs> session yeah. and you've just rung us up in the middle of it and we've had to stop. Cheers, mate. Okay, now. Oh. Right, anyway. Like so, where were we? I think start we're again. probably about to start again, yeah. So I have special guest today, <laughs> not on the phone, actually joining us in person. <laughs> uh, we have got Peter Hooten, lead singer of The Farm. So, band that I've loved from my youth. And you still were... do, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. from my youth, so since my seemed, youth. Seems to be past tense. Yeah, I have loved <laughs> from my youth. Still love, amazing. Look forward to him in 2023. <laughs> Uh, traveling around doing a few tours and festivals we'll get into that a bit later in the conversation yeah yeah uh, craig was a little bit older than me when he got into them albeit it would have been at the same time uh, yeah <laughs> well i, I mean I, I think i i, I sent an email that i sent through that yeah, yeah. genuinely speaking i think the last time i saw you i think it was the riverside newcastle riverside, at the time yeah. I think and we played um, the city hall yeah it could have yeah, been we played the riverside as well and that was the first time in two years we hadn't sold out and I said to the promoter, uh, Simon, when I'm SDM, I said, what's happening? He said, oh, there's this group from America called Nirvana playing at the university. Right. And that, wow. was, uh, that was the first time we'd, we realised then there was a new movement coming. Yeah, of, of yeah. Grunge, they ended up calling it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So what was it like, you know, I mean, take me through the journey that the you've journey. had, you know, so mm. obviously growing up in the... 70s, 80s, yeah, yeah. all that sort of stuff, and football yeah. culture. You're a Liverpoolian yeah. fan, uh, well, a red, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. a Liverpool fan, all that sort of jazz. And so, go on, tell us what was it so like? I've always been obsessed with football and music, you know. Yeah. And they never really came together. Uh, but I started doing a fanzine in the 1980s when I was a youth worker in a place called Cancel Farm. Um, and I wanted, I was going to concerts but I was also going to uh, football matches. And I was seeing the same people at both, but the mainstream press weren't really associating the two. Yeah. Yeah. They were separate, you know. And especially the music papers, no one in the music industry had mentioned football. Mm. It was a no-no, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, there was a lot of trouble back in those days as well. Yeah, though, I mean, the way certain in. groups would mention was the Angelic Upstarts and, and, and uh, groups like that. Um, and they attracted a lot of trouble, you know. Yeah. Uh, so that's why people, I think, steered away from it, you know. Yeah. Um, but the fanzine that it did um, brought the two together, you know. Uh -huh. It was regarded as the, what, the first magazine to do that, really, you know. Right. But I was just writing about my own personal experiences yeah. and the people I was going to concerts with or going to football matches with. So it didn't seem revolutionary to me. It was just normal life, you know, and... I wanted the end to be like the uh, the private eye for the working class. That's what I always yeah, thought, yeah. you mm. know, because uh, I wanted to make people laugh, you know, basically, you know. And uh, uh, the whole idea of it was that, you know, you get on in, in, in writing what you were saying in the pub, you mm. know, and that would be reflected on various characters. So we, every sacred cow in Liverpool, was attacked, you know, without question, you know. Yeah. Uh, but with a tongue in cheek, with humour, you know. Yeah. In yeah. fact, there was a local DJ, uh, Billy Butler, who was, who was very knowledgeable, but we, we kept on, uh, you know, uh, criticising him, you know, with uh, and put him in. We had an ins and outs column. The ins and outs column was based upon uh, magazines like The Face, and I, who, who were basically saying what's fashionable. So we yeah. were, we were basically ridiculing that, you know. Mm. Uh, but in the end, Billy Butler said, I, I, you know, he, he threatened to meet us, you know, come and meet me, you know. And when we met him, we got all like, on like a house on fire, you know, because very knowledgeable about music, very knowledgeable about football, and got the drinks in all night. So, uh, you <laughs> it know, always helps, doesn't it? So we've been friends ever since. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> you know. But I mean, one of the things that I, I, I kind of, 
realise growing up, and it's only when you look back at things, you kind of think, wow, that really did happen and it happened for a reason and so yeah. on and so forth. And we talked a little bit about it off screen as well. But that whole subculture of football, music, fashion, and yeah. I remember as a, I'm an, obviously a Newcastle fan, growing up in the North East, we didn't really get exposed to a lot of the brands that kind of no. emerged from Liverpool, if you yeah, like, because yeah. you were in Europe, you are bringing back like a Lesse, yeah. Lacoste, all that sort of stuff. And it really, like Liverpool in general, you know, was was like the start of that really and yeah, you were right in the midst of that right in many respects yeah i think it was and i think it was um i mean it happened in the 60s with the mods didn't it yeah mm. it was a neo-mod look i always said it was an italian look really a yeah. neo-mod look yeah and and that's, yeah and it, almost like a preppy look in america yeah, yeah. you know so it was uh you know, people would wear, you know, I remember a massive craze of people wearing snorkels, the, but not the green ones, mm. the blue ones, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And it's what kids used to wear for school. Yeah. Uh, but then all the people started wearing them as like, you know, uh, also duffel coats. Yeah. Duffel coats were absolutely massive in Liverpool with all people who went to the football matches. And then yeah. there was Peter Storms. A lot of it was mountaineering gear as well, you know. Yeah, I think so it wasn't we just still... sports gear. It was yeah. various stuff. And then there was, yeah. Yeah, we were into donkey jackets, I think, and still were 18-inch yeah, yeah, yeah. Doc Martens. <laughs> Tottenham fans were famous for that, yeah, donkey yeah. jackets. Yeah. But um, it wasn't until um, the farm became successful and we had a, a DJ called Terry Farley, who was a Chelsea yeah, fan. Yeah, yeah. And he said to me, it didn't cross over in London. We were always surprised when we went to London. Uh, a lot of fans would be shouting over the fences, uh, soul boys. So, boys, we, what are they talking about? And it was only when Terry Farley explained this to me that the people who look like us were like the, the Paul Wellers who were into yeah, so yeah, yeah. You know, that type of look, yeah. uh, like a neo mod look. Yeah. They went to nightclubs. They didn't go to the football matches. You know, they yeah. didn't cross over there. You know, I think that's um, that was significant. You know, that was significant. But then, quite soon. Uh, within a few years, people started dressing in old men's clothes, like tweed jackets and yeah. Norfolk jackets. And barber coats were massive in Liverpool, but they were also massive with the slow and ranger community. Mm -hmm. But in Liverpool, every pe second person had a barber coat, you know. Yeah, yeah. And it was a phenomenon, really, you know. And what, I think, uh, what do you think the, the crossover was so prominent in cities? I guess Manchester, Liverpool, Newcastle, yeah. Birmingham. I mean, I, I certainly remember my brother being mad into it, yeah. Pringle and whatever else. I mean, he's 10 years older than me. Yeah. But there wasn't in London. Do you think it's the size of the city that Probably made the a Probably the size, difference? yeah. And Liverpool and Manchester are a lot smaller, obviously. And yeah. Also, the music people were listening to, the clubs they were going to, you know, mm. uh, and that, that type of thing, really. It, it was complicated, you know. I think what what started off is that that the the look that uh, people had going to football matches was that wedge hairstyle. Yeah, it was a very effeminate look, you know. Mm. So a lot of the clubs in town, a lot of you know, straights would go to the gay clubs, you know. Yeah, because they yeah. were playing, you know, uh, they were playing Roxy music and Bowie. Yeah, and and uh, the normal yeah. TVOD and warm leather and tracks like that, and so they were mixing with different uh, different people you know and I think that it was a very effeminate look and, but you can always guarantee the person with the biggest wedge was probably the hardest lad in the uh, in the in the street or the school you know yeah and it was a phenomenon really and I think it never really never really crossed over to music I mean uh, the human league uh, Phil Oakey had a massive one, but it was exaggerated you know mm. it never really crossed over into into pop music you mm. know uh, people had their icons, and uh, everyone has looked to uh, uh, Bowie and Lowe as yeah. you know, it was German period, as being the period, you know, where uh, it became more and more fashionable, you know. Mm. So when you when you set up the farm, when yeah. you all got together, talk us through that and what were your influences? And <clears throat> My influences were the, uh, I mean, I just used to love the Clash, right. the Jam and uh, the specials, you know, yeah, like that, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, but absolutely. I had come through a period where I was obsessed with Bowie, you know, mm -hmm. and I'd also come through a period where I was obsessed with like the Cockney Rebel. Right. I don't know if you remember them, yeah, but, yeah. and I, I, 
But I, I saw Modest the other day. I also liked some progressive music, but not much, you mm -hmm. know. And in our school, there was always the smoothies and the trogs. Yeah. You know, if it's just probably every school was like that. But the uh, the smoothies were all into Motown, you know. And the uh, the trogs were all into uh, Genesis and Yes and groups like that, yeah. you know, and Pink Floyd. Yeah. You know, but uh, I used to like both, you know. Yeah. I crossed over and I, I didn't see why I had to be a part of a certain tribe. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I always remember um, a few of the smoothies asking me for... To, to borrow me Cockney Rebel albums, you know. Wow. But Cockney Rebel were, they were Bowie obsessives as well, you know. Yeah. So there's a lineage there, you know, and you, you listen to tracks by Mink Deville, Spanish Stroll and that brilliant tracks like that, anything by Lou Reed, you know. So it was, it was big influences, you know. But mm. I'd say, if you, you're going to push me, I'd say The Clash would be my favourite mm. band, you know. Yeah. And uh, I was obsessed with them and Strummer, Luckily, I got to meet Strummer and Mick Jones, you know. I know, yeah. And uh, Mick Jones started another group called Big Audio, and the farm ended up touring America with Big Audio Dynamite. Oh, wow. Well, you know. Uh, so, yeah, um, I, you know, but I, I loved the jam as well. The jam were like, the jam crossed over to the, you know, to the council states. Yeah, no. More absolutely. so than the Clash. Yeah. The Clash did a little bit, but not like the jam. The jam was just having hit single after hit single, yeah. which was getting on top of the pops. Yeah. And of course, famously, the Clash would never go on top of the pops. Yeah, you know? that's right. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think Weller's storytelling was so, so easy to follow. And, you know, even still now, you listen to it and it still feels relatable. Yeah. You yeah. Know, 40, 45 years later, it's, you yeah. know, his well, storytelling was. Just so precise, really. Weller and Strummer, lyricists, you know. Mm. You know, they're, they're up there with Lennon McCartney for me, you know. Yeah. Uh, they were storytellers, you know. And the, the first time you heard, ever heard, you know, down on the tube station at midnight. Yeah. You know, it was like, oh my God, what's this? You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he probably wrote that when he was 19, something like that, you know, absolutely fantastic, you know. But if you look, if you look at Strummer and his lyrics, you know, there were was, was stories and it got you into, it introduced you to politics and different, you know, you know, Spanish bombs, but the Spanish Civil War, you yeah, know. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. And all that. It's yeah. Fantastic, yeah. you know, so, oh, yeah, yeah, it was a, uh, interesting times you know? well, it's interesting listen to you like talk through some of that stuff because i think you know we're obviously recording this at the time of the world cup and yeah you know all the politics that's going on with yeah, FIFA yeah, and the yeah. corruption and all that crap that's going on yeah and it's you know you, as a as a guy that's obviously contributed so much to the music industry yeah. You know, myself and Rob are football kit designers. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. You know, we're lucky enough to be able to do some of some of that stuff as well. We've got a voice when we design certain things. Yeah. But what have you made of all the World Cup stuff that's been going well, on? What do you think of the whole Qatar thing? Uh, it's I, I'm finding it difficult to watch it. You know. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's it's the way of the world, isn't it? And we I've I've just watched FIFA Uncovered. Yeah, on Netflix and it's brilliant, it, isn't it? It blows blows the lid on it. And if the if the FBI hadn't got involved, they'd all still be in position. Yeah, probably, yeah, you know, yeah, but yeah. Hopefully, authorities can learn from that. You know, but I wasn't aware. I mean, I watched the um, 1978 World Cup, and I wasn't aware it was a military junta. Yeah, you know, we, yeah, we didn't. We weren't really yeah. told, were we? You know, mm, yeah. we weren't aware that that was a political statement as well from yeah. the. Uh, the uh, Argentinian uh, junta at the time, you know, yeah. uh, and then also all this stuff with um, with uh, the Brazilians and and um, when they were um, getting together and putting the democracy on the on the on the shirts and the and Socrates, yeah. Yeah. we we weren't really aware of that. We weren't really politi politically enlightened. Yeah, no. So it's right. always happened. Yeah, it's yeah. just I think now the world's a lot smaller now, isn't and it? it's more money involved. Yeah, that's yeah. what it is, isn't it? Well, you I think know? I mean you you reference Brazil there, and that's happened again this year with the elections down there, where Jair Bolsonaro's people have kind of appropriated yeah. Yeah. the Brazil national team shirt, and it's yeah. almost become like a something that the players aren't proud of because they're not aligned with that. Mm. Way but of the the blue thinking. kit was outselling uh, the yellow kit, wasn't it? Yeah, because because the that. blue was Lula. Yeah. And uh, Bolsonaro had adopted the, you know, so they're trying to, re they're trying to reclaim that, aren't they, I think, you know? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, 
I mean, politics and football has always gone hand in hand. Yeah, you know? I mean, it has, even though yeah. people say keep politics out of football, but it's you know, if you look at FIFA uncovered, you can see it from from yeah. the time that FIFA started because it was always political, you know. Yeah, well, we've got a couple of shirts here that obviously relate back to to 1990, and there's yeah. been some great documentaries around that. Yeah, that have yeah, covered. yeah more from an England perspective and what was happening in the UK at the time with the yeah. poll tax riots. And it really was that the, the England team got put in Sardinia because they could be contained yeah. and, yeah, yeah, and yeah, managed. Yeah, yeah. But as always, you know, treat people like animals yeah. and the law of the jungle will prevail. Yeah. Um, but that was a time when it felt like the, the crossover of football and music Became a bit more mainstream. I yeah, mean, obviously, definitely. there was the, the New Order, World in Music, Motion, John Bond. Groups group started talking about the favourite football teams, yeah. which they hadn't done before, you know. And then, obviously, getting New Order to do World in Motion, yeah. which is a classic, whether it's associated with football or not, you know. Yeah. Absolutely brilliant, you know. And the John Barnes rap, which he still does now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, 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 after show uh, speaking events, you know. So yeah, I think that was the year, and also you had uh, independent companies, a lot of them in London, who were doing football-related shirts, which people were wearing in nightclubs. Yeah. One of my favourites was uh, Noala Valencia, which was sold in Tuffer St George, you know. Yeah, yeah. And the farm adopted that, and we had that on our videos, you know. Yeah. Um, and we actually ended up um, in Buckley Hill when we did England used it for two thousand four for the uh, Euros. Uh, we had uh, graffiti put on to the changing rooms of Buckley Hill and Bootle, no Isle of Violencia, and it's never been painted over. Wow. It's fading a bit now, you know, but yeah. nearly 18 years ago that was, you know. Yeah, it's so, great. But I think 1990 was year zero in that respect, you know. Mm. The people started, and, and groups started to be calling. There was a group called Pele. Yeah. There was a group called San Etienne. Yeah, you know? totally. People yeah. started calling themselves after uh, teams, you know, and mm. it, it, it it felt like an exciting period, you know, the, and it was a great period because altogether now it was written about, it's a, it's a peace song, it's an anti-violence song, mm. and it was written about the unofficial truce in the First World War, so yeah. it all related to football, even though, so the, the crossover was absolutely massive. Yeah. Not a lot of journalists in the music press liked it. Yeah. They went along with it. Because it was it was a tidal wave, they yeah. couldn't stop it, you know. Yeah. But they were much happier when grunge came along, you know. Yeah. 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 It's, I mean, it's it's so interesting because, I, you know, if if we, if we took a look at this, yeah. um it's a actually the um, track jacket, the anthem jacket we we used to call them. Yeah. Um, and we did a lot of the graphics with Peter Saddle. Oh right. Yeah. Who obviously did a lot of the stuff with New Order, yeah, 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 and all yeah. that sort of stuff. Yeah. And I worked on this with um, another graphic designer, Stuart Scott Curran. Yeah. But again, if we talk about culture, politics, everything that goes with it, the whole kind of fabric background to this was the fact that the St. George's flag yeah. had almost been demonised because of the hooligan element to it. On the it. right wing, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, when you talk about, like, your lyrics and what you're writing about and as even as designers we're looking at things and how do we you know kind of have these little breadcrumbs these yeah. little messages mm. and that was all about how do we take the st george's flag and make it a flag for everybody so right. there was a home kit that had multicolored st george's flags on it yep. It was meant to represent all the different cultures that we have right, yeah. as england and then it morphed into all these different graphics so you know I think we're, that that's why I think there's so much of a crossover mm. yeah. in all the different areas is because we're all looking to make little statements yeah. wherever we can. And, you know, as they, long they, as we don't get a yellow card. Yeah, well, that's, that's the most yeah. important thing, isn't it? Yeah, don't no. risk a booking, whatever you do. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm hoping that that's going to, again, yeah. but when we're airing this, this is what we're talking about. First is the one, week of the World Cup. One yeah. love badge, um, yeah. you know, armband. It would be mm. great if Keane actually did go out and... Do it. Yeah, yeah. And it's ironic as well when we talk about the George Crosses that Italian IT was still England fans were waving Union Jacks. Yeah. So it was yeah, you know, yeah, bizarre yeah. that it was the British flags and then yeah. like say the hooliganism yeah. died out and as it came resurrected again, that was when it started to be the George mm. Cross that was appropriated. Yeah. It's, a, it's mm. a weird little mm. I don't know, quirk of mm. quirk of history, right? Really. Yeah. 
Well, when yeah. when um, the FA approached us about using all together now for the Euro 2004, we were a bit apprehensive, really, you know. But we went down to Solway Square where they were based, and they gave us a big, uh, you know, presentation on how they wanted to bring the country together. And mm. they said we were going to actually use all together now for Euro 96, but Everton had used it the year before, you know. Right. Uh, How'd you feel about that? Well, you know, there was a lad in the group who was an Evertonian. Yeah. And his lad, uh, you know, I, I wasn't a, I wasn't a big fan of them using it, not because it was Everton, just because they were changing the lyrics, you know. Yeah. And I could have opposed them changing the lyrics, you know. But yeah. in the end, my dad, who's been a season ticket all the, since the sixties at Anfield, said, "Well, I thought the song was about meeting in no man's land with the enemy. Yeah. You know, you, you're a hypocrite if you don't let them yeah, use it. Yeah, yeah. But if we hadn't let them use it." You wouldn't have had uh, three lines. Nah, you would have yeah. had all together now as the Euro '96 theme. Yeah. Do you ever wonder how different your bank balance would be if you yeah, well, spent your brodies to all, right it, out of that? Isn't it? It's always getting used. It's always getting yeah. used, and it's it's perennial, you know. And that must be know, like really quite a thing, right? I yeah, mean, it is. I mean, during the pandemic, it was used by in uh, by Santander in Spain. Yeah. But then picked up by South American countries. Wow. Uh, and they used it for their PPE response, you know, about um, raising money to get um, um, masks and, and, and protective clothing, you know. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, it's, something's always happening, you know. Yeah, so they're leaving a legacy. I mean, we talk a lot about, you know, we've been so lucky to design yeah. World Cup winning kits and, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, certainly over the last few few weeks there's been loads of documentaries about brazil winning yeah. 2002 which for me which is, is yeah, yeah which is amazing and i guess that's the closest thing i'm ever going to yeah. get to writing like yeah, yeah. the track that's being used i mean it, it's it's such a thing i mean yeah you just burst with pride so mm. yeah, yeah. i mean we, we describe it when people ask us as being surreal like yeah. people ask me seeing yeah. italy lift the world cup i'm like it doesn't make sense it doesn't it doesn't, no. it doesn't feel like no. it's the idea i know i did it but it doesn't compute. I'm not like, oh, well, that's it's an out of body experience. Yeah. I mean, did, <laughs> did you think when you wrote that song, it was going to be as successful as it was? No, not really. No. I mean, we we remember recording it. We didn't really have the chorus. We had the went the verses, and it, yeah. was, it was appropriated from another song that we did on our first John Peel session in the mid '80s. You know, and our guitarist always said, I think the. Uh, the wall advert, he called it the wall advert, which is Packerbell's Cannon, the yeah. classical piece of music. I think that has really worked with your uh, lyrics about No Man's Land, because it was originally called No Man's Land. And when we put them together and slowed it down, it worked perfectly, you know. Wow. But I'd, I'd put off the idea for three or four years, you know, because I didn't know whether it would work or not. Yeah. But we were in a rehearsal room in London and we played it to Soaks, who was producing the album, you know, Spartacus. And Teddy Farley was co-producer, you know, played it to them and they said, that's that's the one, that's the single, you know, yeah. that's the next single, you know. Yeah. Uh, and it wasn't until we got back to Liverpool that I got the idea for All Together Now, you know, yeah. Uh, in No Man's Land. It just, it just worked perfectly, you know. Yeah, yeah. class. Well, I'm going to mix it up a little bit now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I've, I've got a kit here yeah. that I want you to talk us through. So we do kit reviews. Oh, my you, God. You, you're kind of one of the godfathers of the mashup of football, fashion, and music. So we'd love for you to have a Yeah, yeah, yeah well, I wonder your... what it's going to be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and here I've it done, is, the new Everton <laughs> <laughs> I've deliberately got out what I think is one of the most horrendous Liverpool kits of all time. If but any I'm of sure our viewers have yeah. got photo sensitive that, right? epilepsy, no, don't uh, look at this. I'm inclined to agree with you. <laughs> I'm inclined to agree. I did, when I first came out, <laughs> I said it was very much like a, a new order, like a Savile design, but yeah. you know, like unknown pleasures. But yeah. with the, you know, they've just changed the lines instead of being yeah. straight lines, you know. But yeah. uh, it's not, it's not something. Um, I mean, you certainly wouldn't I want to see wouldn't, them with wouldn't be a wearing hat, that on tour next year, won't you? It's very psychedelic. You know? let's, let's 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 put it that way. Maybe the you know. Maybe the Beatles would would yeah, like it. Yeah. You know, so if you're going to give it a mark, a so we always do marks out of eleven. Yeah. What would you give that marks out of eleven? 
I'd give that a, a minus two. <laughs> Which that's the lowest score we've ever had on the that's channel. The you might remember the, uh, the Lazio shirt from last season. It was a dreadful kit. That got, yeah. that got minus one, didn't it, Lazio? Yeah, It'd be interesting to know, uh, you know... Uh, what the sales figures would be like for that. You yeah. know, It'd be interesting to know the backstory as well, where, I think, you know, we know the backstory. Someone had been out all night, mate. Yeah, it's all, yeah. <laughs> it's all together now, and like, oh, it's purposeful and it's meaningful. Yeah, it's like, yeah. where's these graphics come from? And yeah. It's like, oh. I mean, I know there's massive debate on social media, isn't it, when a new kit comes oh, out, yeah. but I think there was universal, like, what the hell is that? Yeah. yeah you know, it's mad know. because we reviewed all the Liverpool <clears throat> kits over the last um, couple of seasons, and I think the one which was 2021, was it? The one with the really nice neckline yeah, that had yeah. the orange in it? Yeah, yeah. I actually thought that was one of Very the cool. nicest yeah, kits yeah, yeah. it had for a long time. Mm. But um, yeah, they seem to have lost the plot with that one. Yeah, followed yeah. Um, this horror show. So thanks so much, Peter, for coming in. Yeah. Yeah. Been a pleasure. Thanks Absolutely. Been a pleasure. Dream Thank come you. true to, to meet you. So thanks a lot. Hope you've enjoyed it at home as much as we've enjoyed sitting here and chatting. And we'll look forward to catching you next time on the channel. Thanks. I've got to do um, <clears throat> a selfie though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you were going to say you got to find that fucking person back. <laughs> 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 <laughs>